Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Philip Shepherd. I'm a fine art uh, auctioneer and valuer with Shepherd's Auction House in Durrow and County Leash. And uh, today I'm going to talk about really three kind of things. I want to talk about the Anglo-Irish, um, the uh, ethnic group or social class. I want to talk about two paintings, <coughs> excuse me, by two different artists. Uh, one has to do with uh, going to a levee at Dublin Castle, and the other relates to Queen Victoria's visit to Dublin in 1900, uh, both being state occasions. So, Percy French, if not strictly scientific in his methods, was nevertheless scientific in his attitude towards nature and reality. His transported bog scenes, which are well known to everybody with light that glistens and shimmers on water, are wonderfully satisfying to engage with. In making truth the aim of his art, truth to the facts, to perceived and experienced reality, his outlook evinced the same forces that shaped scientific attitude itself. Above all, as did his fellow realists, he shared a scientist's respect for facts as the basis of truth. But how closely does Percy French's oeuvre relate to the social and political issues of his day? All art is, of course, an integral part of the social structure. To argue, to assert, to affirm, this is to say everything and nothing. The Boyne Valley tombs of the Neolithic period, the epic Tawnbow Colina, Waterford's Reginald Tower, Daniel MacLeese's marriage of Strongbow and, and Ephra, Sean Keating's Men of the South, Joyce's Ulysses, Martin O'Kine's Crane the Killer, John B. Keane's The Field, are all inextricably enmeshed with the environment in which they were made, and which they are a part. Yet it seems to me that an art whose explicit goal is a depiction and analysis of contemporary life, and whose point of reference is the changing yet concrete appearances of the contemporary world, that art will be more directly and materially involved with the social conditions of its time than would say an art which is concerned solely with ideals and symbolism. William Percy French was born at Cloney Quinn, County Roscommon, on the 1st of May, 1854. He was a minor Anglo, his was a minor Anglo-Irish landed family that was part of the Protestant ascendancy. The Anglo-Irish Protestant ascendancy was the political economic and social domination of Ireland between the 17th and early 20th century by a minority of landowners, Protestant clergy and members of the professions. The historical experience was such that the Protestant minority was almost exclusively descended from uh, British plantation stock. The linkage between religion and national identity and patronage was rooted in the reconquest of Ireland during the uh, Tudor and, and Stuart periods. The, the, this is stuck here on me, but anyway. The, I've got it, uh, thank you. The defeat of the Catholic Jacobites in 1691 confirmed British Protestant domination in Ireland. The 18th century penal laws used religion to distinguish colonists from the colonized, and in doing so, copper fastened religion and national identity in Ireland. Historically, Catholics were subordinated to Protestants who relied on their connection with the British state for law and, where necessary, physical force to protect their economic and political power. In return, Irish landlords aligned with the Protestant middle class to form the basis of the British state in Ireland. To many nationalists, the Protestant ascendancy and its retainers were the English garrison in Ireland. To their English political masters, by the close of the 18th century, they were a garrison whose trust they had lost. A little over half a century before Percy French was born, the power of the ascendancy began to decline in the aftermath of the 1798 rebellion, the rise of Napoleon, and the chronic fear of a French invasion. The Irish Parliament, sitting in Dublin, enticed and seduced by bribes and corrupted by preferments, that flowed freely from London, voted itself out of existence and into a new political arrangement to be known as the United Kingdom of Great Britain 
and Ireland. Opposed to the project was the long-standing Member of Parliament for County Roscommon, Arthur French of French Park, described by his contemporary, Sir Jonah Barrington, as a country gentleman of high character. He was alleged to have been offered an earldom if he would support the Union of Ireland with Great Britain, but refused to accept the honour. When Arthur French died on the 24th of November, 1820, it was reported at the time that he had died, not from the gout, that king of diseases and disease of kings, or the rich man's disease, but rather he succumbed from excessive fox hunting. <laughs> the 1801 Act of Union of Great Britain and Ireland shifted political power from Dublin to London and was followed by Irish economic decline and widespread movement of the ruling class to the new centre of power at Westminster. This power shift resulted in an increased number of absentee landlords in Ireland. In 1829, due to the agitation by Daniel O'Connell and his Catholic Association, one of the first mass membership political movements in the world, a limited version of Catholic emancipation was enacted by the Imperial Parliament at Westminster. Thereafter, the ascendancy faced competition from a nascent Catholic middle class in Parliament, the professions, the judiciary, and for commissions in the army now needed in the growing British Empire. The Great Irish Famine greatly magnified native grievances towards members of the ascendancy who were by now reviled as absentee landlords. Absentee or resident, more than one in ten Irish landlords went bankrupt as their famine-stricken tenants could not pay any rent. In the intercensal period 1841 to 1851, County Ross Common lost 31% of its entire population, the highest population loss for any county in the country. In neighbouring County Mayo, the Brown family lost 50,000 acres. Much nearer to home, Major Dennis Mann's Stroke Sound Park estate saw a population decline of 88%. The eviction of an estimated 3,000 people and of those that sought to escape the ravages of famine and disease to build a new life in America, hundreds of them died on coffin ships. Terry Dooley, Professor Terry Dooley has estimated this to be as high as 70% of them died on coffin ships. In November 1847, Major Mahan lost his life when he became the first and most high profile Irish landlord to be murdered during the Great Famine period. When Percy French was 15 years old, the decline of the ascendancy was further hastened with the disestablishment of the Church of Ireland Act 1869. No longer the official state church, the Church of Ireland was now legally divorced from the Church of England and would no longer receive funding from the public purse. This traumatic severance did not, however, alter the loyalty of its members to the state, whose symbols were and still are ubiquitous throughout their churches. Not anymore would its prelates hold ex officio seats in the House of Lords. Gone was its parliament in Dublin, and now the status of its church had ceased to be, by law, established. A competing and ever more hungry Catholic merchant class was emerging, and on its heels, as it increasingly ratcheted its economic power on foot of gains made following the socio-economic shifts that occurred in the wake of the Great Famine. As the Catholic economic well-being began to rise, the socio-economic and political circumstances of the ascendancy waned. It was further hastened by a series of land acts that by the time of Percy French's death in 1920 had successfully transferred the ownership of most Irish estates to peasant proprietorship. The democratization of local government in Ireland with the creation of county and rural district councils at the close of the 19th century was a further nail in the ascendancy coffin. The Local Government Act of Ireland 1898 politically disempowered and emasculated a Protestant dominated grand jury system whose role was now reduced more or less to purely nominal and ceremonial duties and functions. While the trust and pain of accumulated losses, in this case a parliament, sectarian privilege, educational advantage, vocational advancement, an established church, and the divestment of landed estates are easily perceived or understood, less clear, 
self-evident or apparent is the impact that the knock-on effects on the community that was connected to the Protestant ascendancy and its retainers by blood and treasure. From as early as the 1890s, Protestants were articulating awareness of the erosion of their power and influence. The Archbishop of Dublin, Joseph Peacock, who, by the way, was born in Abbey Leaks, accepted as much in a sermon he delivered at the Mount Melick Parish Church. David Fitzpatrick, in an important contribution to the debate on Protestant depopulation, concluded that, quote, inexorable decline of Southern Protestantism was largely self-imposed. Protestant marital endogamy was an internal social dynamic with negative demographic consequences. The constriction of personal freedom of marriageable Protestants in the decades post disestablishment impacted union formation and was an important factor influencing both emigration and the declining birth rate. Fergus Campbell's book, The Irish Establishment, a detailed and wide-ranging monograph on Ireland's social elites, argues that although enormous shifts in economic and political power were taking place at the middle levels of Irish society, the Irish establishment remained remarkably static and unchanged. The Irish landlord class and the Irish Protestant middle class, especially businessmen and professionals, retained critical positions of power and the rising Catholic middle class was largely, although not entirely, excluded from this establishment elite. Campbell suggests that this was the strange intermediate nature of Ireland's relationship with Britain under the Act of Union from 1801 to 1922, which was neither a straightforward colony nor fully integrated part of the United Kingdom that created the tensions that eventually caused the Union itself to unravel. It is not a coincidence that Rose Barton's Going to the Levy at Dublin Castle is featured on the cover of Campbell's Erudite Study. A delicate watercolour dated 1897, it is an important fien de siècle evocation of crowds of onlookers watching a cavalcade of grandees as it makes its way to the east gate of Dublin Castle, its main entrance. All are headed to the Viceroy's Levy, a social state loyalty asserting event for gentlemen only. Ladies were excluded. The Viceroy, also called Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, served as the representative of the British Crown in Ireland. His official residence was the Viceregal Lodge in Dublin's Phoenix Park, now Aris and Uchtaran, home to the President of Ireland. Rose Barton's painting serves as a prelude to an event three years later, when much, much larger crowds would line Dublin streets and its thoroughfares. This time they waited patiently to catch a glimpse, not of the Irish voice ride, Sir William Harcourt, but a woman who is eponymous with an age, Her Majesty Victoria, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, Queen, Defender of the Faith, Empress of India. Queen Victoria came to Ireland to pay tribute to the Irish troops who fought in the Boer War, while serving with the British Army. Earlier that year, Queen Victoria instructed all ranks of her regiment to wear a sprig of shamrock in their headdresses. Her Majesty the Queen is pleased to order that in future on St. Patrick's Day, all ranks in Her Majesty's Irish regiments shall wear as a distinction a sprig of shamrock in their headdress to commemorate the gallantry of her soldiers during the recent battles in South Africa. The Irish Guards Regiment was raised by order of Queen Victoria just days before her visit to Ireland when she came to pay tribute to the gallantry of her Irish soldiers. Many nationalists believed her visit to simply be a British Army recruitment campaign for the ongoing war in South Africa. Ideals and symbols and changing and concrete appearances of contemporary life are, it seems to me, fully embodied in this small but important painting about the same size as a postcard. This is the sole work by Percy French in the collection of the National Gallery of Ireland. It's a watercolour and paper measuring 23 by 14 centimetres, like I said, postcard size. Unsigned and not dated, the work was purchased by the gallery as recently as 1975. 
Originally titled The Queen's Entry into Dublin, it was described in the studio, the December 1900 edition, as being no more than a bright bit of colour when the work was shown at the Dublin Sketching Club exhibition. Another version of the painting, somewhat less resolved, with minor variations, similar in size but signed and dated, is in the Victorian collection of Her Majesty the Queen in the care of the Royal Collection Trust. The title of the National Gallery version is Queen Victoria's Entry Through Dublin City Gate, Leeson Street, Lower Bridge, April 1900. This gives us key information that's more often than not lost through the cracks of time, the who, the what, the where and the when. It's all there in the title. History 101 tells us that the lifeblood of any historical inquiry is the primary source. French's watercolour is first and foremost that, a historical primary source. It is an eyewitness account of a historical event, Queen Victoria's fourth and final visit to Ireland, the artist as witness. As was its practice, French worked on plein air, a modus operandi that is in contrast to studio painting or academic rules that might create a predetermined look. But here at the Grand Canal, waiting for the grand entry, the artist is confronted with symbols that dominate the scene, imposed by the state to underpin a public performance of imperial power. Their imposition was purposeful, premeditated and planned. Royal pageantry is self-evidently a tactic for the legitimation and reification of royal power. Monarchs use monumental architecture as a means to represent their authority, to demonstrate their power over their people. These monumental elevations are visual statements of their ideology of power. Much of the nature of political power in any society can be discerned by looking at the physical symbols it produces in its architecture. An example of an architectural expression of imperial power is to be seen in Sir Edmund Lutyens' Delhi, designed and constructed during the period of the British Raj in India. However, it was not Lutyens, but Belfast-born architect Thomas Drew, later Sir Thomas, who was commissioned to design a temporary gateway at Leeson Street Bridge for the upcoming royal visit. The public decorations in the streets, the private decorations in the houses, the garlands all along the eight-mile routes from Kingsbridge to the Viceregal Lodge were to reach a climax here at the Grand Canal Bridge at Leeson Street. This was the point of the city boundary at which the Queen, having passed through the townships of Pembroke and Rathmines, was to enter Dublin. Victoria, should be noted, was familiar with triumphal arches from an early age. Marble Arch in London was completed just in time for her coronation. She was just 18 years old. While 30 arches were constructed along the route from London to Brighton in celebration of her marriage to her beloved and later deeply mourned Prince Albert. Thomas Drew modelled his triumphal arch not on, from antiquity or the ancient past, but rather on Bagotsrath Castle, a late 13th century fortress that once stood on present-day Bagot Street. It's reckoned probably number 44, 45, 46. Both tower parapets have distinctive Irish stepped crenellations, and each are depicted flying the new Dublin city flag devised just 15 years earlier. It features a green field with a gold harp and three white two-towered burning castles on a navy canton. The gold harp represents both Ireland and Leinster, while the three burning candles are the lesser coat of arms of the city. Green and blue are the two national colours of Ireland. The central flagstaff hints at a lowered flag, most likely the royal standard waiting to be raised in line with royal protocol when the Queen had crossed the threshold and entered the city. Inset above the portal, within a frame, is a recumbent shield in low relief bearing the Dublin City Arms, Civic Sword, Great Mace and the Cap of Maintenance, the latter which was given as a gift by Charles II in 1661 to the then Lord Mayor. The Great Civic Sword had been used in civil cer civic ceremonies ever since Henry IV gave it to the City of Dublin in 1409. Cruciform arrow loops and arrow slits, the narrow vertical apertures in the walls of the towers, reinforce the theatrical backdrop of a defended medieval castle befitting the ceremonial welcoming of the reigning monarch. 
Dublin city has English monarchical roots and allegiances that stretch as far back as 1171, when King Henry II landed with an army and asserted his authority. Thus began Dublin's long, complex, involved and multifaceted relationship with the British Crown. Almost all of the pictorial narrative devices employed by Rose Barton in her going to the levee at Dublin Castle are present in French's painting. State occasion, participants, procession, crowds, cavalcade, gateway, entry, events, exclusion. Barton's onlookers, informal, undirected and self-policed, seem to be present just by happenstance. Juxtaposed French's spectators are present in a conscious and intentionally ordered manner, cordoned off as they are by lines of military guards. The drapery of Barton's crowd of onlookers seems to be randomly attired and more broad spectrum. In contrast, the royal spectators are portrayed in drapery more uniform and divide of their flags less colourful. If the apparel doth oft proclaim the man, then turn of the century millinery may be a reliable indicator of social class. In the bottom foreground of, um, sorry, in the, in the bottom foreground of French's, um, I've gone a little wrong here. I'll just get to it. Yeah, in, in, in the bottom foreground of French's painting, an enthusiastic male spectator is seen continuing to wave his bowler hat even as the Queen has passed by. Others similarly be hatted or suggested. The flat caps of the working classes are notably absent. Less discernible are the bonnets worn by the ladies. Instead, still in search of a class indicators, we must rely on an anonymous wit who in 1896 defined a bonnet as a thing made partly of ribbon and partly of lace, but principally of price. <laughs> um, sorry. I just a bit mixed up here. So what I'll do is, as, as I'm talking, I'm going to play it in the background. We actually have a, a movie reel of... Um, this is actually a, a, a news reel at the time. It lasts for about two and a half minutes. And this is... French is situated on the other side of the arch, but this, there's four carriages coming through. The Queen is in the fourth carriage. Anyway, just back to the painting. The spectators are summarised in a few telling dots and streaks of pigment, marvels of French's pictorial shorthand, no more detailed than a child's stick figures. The roadway leading to the triumphal arch is bedecked with festive bunting and flags as grandees pass by in a procession of horse-drawn carriages. They're escorted by troops of cavalry and accompanied by outriders. Mounted troopers of the lifeguards, easily identifiable by their scarlet tunics, metal cuirasses, helmets with onion-shaped white plumes, escort Queen Victoria's carriage. The royal carriage is fourth and last. Newspaper accounts report Prince Beatrice and Prince Christian sitting facing the Queen, who is seated alone to the right. Her two royal attendants, footmen, obscure the artist's field of vision of her as she passes through the gateway. This compositional challenge is easily met by French, who, with a deft stroke and dab, succeeds in bringing the Queen into our view. In her sight, but not ours, is the Dublin Lord Mayor and his entourage waiting to welcome her to their fair city. So that's where he's welcomed there. So Percy French saw in the Queen's visit marvellous material for a monologue. For an imagined account of the Queen's after-dinner speech, he created the character of Deputy Assistant Waiter Jamesy Murphy, who gave his own account of the dinner at the Vice Regal Lodge at the Phoenix Park. Here is an extract referring to the reaction of the Queen following her meeting with Dublin's Lord Mayor Pyle. And my heart fairly glowed, says she, along the rock road, says she, and by Merrion Round, says she, to Butterstown, says she, till I came to the ridge, says she, of the Leeson Street Bridge, says she, and was welcomed in style, says she, by a beautiful smile, says she, of me Lord Mayor Pyle, says she, 
Faith, if I'd done right, says she, I'd make him a knight, says she. True to her royal word, six months later, on the 24th of September, 1900, Thomas Devereux Pyle was created first Baron Pyle of Kenilworth House, Rathgar, County Dublin. He was the last titled and the last unionist politician to be Lord Mayor of Dublin. Deputy Assistant Waiter James E. Murphy's report, however, wasn't limited to the soon be Sir Thomas Pyle. James's account continues. Here's me best respect, says she, and I'm proud this day, she see, of the elegant way, says she, ye gave me the hand, says she, when I came to land, says she, and that other one, says she, that maud gone, says she, <laughs> dressing in black, says she, to welcome me back, says she, and all that gammon, says she, about me bringing famine, says she, now Maud ill writes, is she, that I brought the blights, is she, or altered the seasons, is she, for some private raisins, is she, and I think and there's a slate, is she, of Willie Yates, is she, he should be home, is she, French polish and a poem, is she, and not writing letters, is she, about his betters, is she, parading me crimes, is she, in the Irish Times, is she, but what they can't draw, is she, is the lion's claw, is she, and before our flags furl, is she, we'll own the world, is she. Percy French's painting is one of royal spectacle, order, power, military might, and is populated by subjects loyal to the British crown. Absent are the nationalist politicians who actively protested the royal visit and stayed away. Maud Gaughan branded Victoria, unfairly, the famine queen and organised a children's party to counter the Children's Day where 52,000 children showed up in the Phoenix Park to greet the Queen. They included 100 Protestant children who arrived via special train hired by Viscount de Vesey of Abbey Leaks. Irish nationalism was slowly evolving as the dominant ideology and was beginning to bind diverse individuals with many interests into a people, a people that were distinct from their powerful neighbours in Britain. Irish nationalism began to act as a motive for economic, cultural and sporting achievement. Organisations like the Gaelic League and Gaelic Athletic Association provided a genuine sense of pride, ambition and organisation that was slowly beginning to corrode and to undermine structures of British authority in Ireland. The British authorities were aware of the dangers these developments presented. Inspector General and County Inspector monthly reports kept Dublin Castle fully informed of events everywhere, from the local weather to the tone of the local newspapers. The County Inspector for the Queen's County, which is now Leash, reported that the Mount Melick Brass and Reed Band paraded the town with a black flag in protest of the Queen's visit. When a riot broke out, the Royal Irish Constabulary attempted to retrieve the flag after it was draped in the window of their band room. Multiple arrests and prosecutions followed. It's unlikely that Percy French was aware of this isolated riot or that indeed Maud Gaughan had visited Mount Melick beforehand where she preached her radical gospel. But as his after-dinner speech parody bears out, French was alert to the rumblings of an embryonic Irish nationalism, a new type of nationalism that was beginning to germinate in fertile soil and was about to take root. He knew Ireland and its people intimately. His travels, his songs, his landscapes fully support this view. An initial reading of the painting commemorating Queen's Victoria visit to Dublin in 1900 reveals an unmistakably important ceremonial state occasion taking place. Contemporaneous photographs and newsreels together with newspaper accounts support the accuracy of French's snapshot depiction of the royal spectacle as it unfolded in 1900. However, and admittedly less obvious, are further readings that suggest to me a much, much deeper meaning than a truthful yet superficial pictorial recording of a historic event. Here it seems to me Percy French goes deeper, much deeper. He subverts the powerful symbolism of the castellated triumphal arch and flipped it into an Irish nationalist gateway to national self-determination. This inversion is forcefully reinforced with flags fused with national symbols of Ireland and its capital, Dublin. Meanwhile, the central flagpole by protocol reserved for the Royal Standard or Royal Banner 
is notably left empty, almost, that is. A hint of red remains at the base of the empty flagpole to remind the viewer of what has been deliberately omitted. Ordinarily, the royal standard, then as now, had major status. It takes precedence over all flags in the United Kingdom, including the Union flag. The arch, once hailed as triumphal, is now parodied as a one-way gateway through which there is no return. Queen Victoria, personifying British rule in Ireland, a dominance then, as always, on a knife edge of time, passes through this portal into political oblivion and in doing so into history. Thank you.